I'm glad walking with God is not like going to a casino. I don't go to casinos. I don't know why people... I go to about Las Vegas once a year because of the church I go out there. And they said, you want to go to the strip? I said, no, not really. That stuff doesn't... For whatever reason, that stuff doesn't interest me. But a lot of people act like their relationship with the Lord is like a casino, even Pentecostals. They're like, she da 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 did it work? I don't know. <laughs> Part of fellowshipping with the Lord is that you should have answered prayer. It's not like going to a casino. Maybe I hope he hears me. No, he hears everything you say. It may take a year. It may take two years. It may take two weeks. But he hears everything you say. And you don't even, they don't even have to be spiritual things. You can ask them just for, how many have ever been to Hawaii? You want to go to Hawaii? Ask God to bring you to Hawaii. It's not like he's broke. <laughs> Where are you seated? Heavenly places. It's not like, that. well, no, Gabriel got a wing clip, man. Ab, we're cutting back this week. <laughs> now think about it. Some people, when they relate to God, they view him in such a small way. Listen, the Lord told me many years ago, he said, if I have your heart, I'll give you the world. Like, I mean, he's giving you a mansion. So it's not like he's like, no, that's too much. You know what I found, though, when you get big things like that, I, I don't live, I live in a uh, redone farmhouse, not real big, but it, it's like enough for me because the bigger stuff you get, you got to take care of it. And I have no interest in cutting lawn. <laughs> Who does that? Like, guy, guys have told me, like, oh, I love doing that. No, I don't. I got delivered a clean in my house two years ago. There was a lady I was having dinner with her, and she said, I, I just feel, I, I love cleaning houses, and I became a partner in her ministry. <laughs> it's true. Lee, there's some promises the Lord gave you many years ago when you became born again, and they've yet to come to pass. And the Lord says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire realizes a tree of life. In Matthew 11, tw uh, 12, from the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven comes up. Uh, why can't I? I am having trouble thinking tonight. But the Lord says, contend for the promises that I gave you many years ago, for this is a season of fulfillment. And he's anointing your ears to hear his voice, and he's adjusting your heart so that you would hear from a different frequency. The Lord is adjusting your frequency in this season to hear him. Do you know, sometimes we, we, think, we think like ministry's got to be a struggle. And you've had a lot of challenges in ministry. You've won some battles, you've lost some battles, but you never lost your heart for the Lord. But the Lord says that this place that I brought you to, you're going to finish well, you're going to end well, and you're going to see the promises of the Lord fulfilled. The Lord says, just because you left the church doesn't mean the promise left from your life. And the Lord says to you tonight, I'm going to take you, though, uh, to Hebrews 4, verse 1. Though you're still going to contend for promises, it's going to be from a place of rest. And the next 10, to, the Lord's going to give you 10 to 15 years of fruitful ministry from a place of rest and honor, and it will be without struggle. Amen. And the Lord tells you, that sometimes the enemy tries to convince us everything we do in ministry has got to be a struggle. The Lord says, in this season, it's going to be for, come from a place of rest. And you need to take a vacation too, the Lord says. <laughs> Let's just lift our hands. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. And the Lord says, even in this region, I'm looking for a people who would stand in a place of faith and trust and believe me for what has not been but what I've always desired for this region. I'm looking for a people of simple trust who when they hear my voice, they'll trust it and follow no matter what it looks like and no matter what, what the consequences are. For the Lord says that this is a critical season in this region and in the earth. And I'm looking for people not to back down. The Lord says it is not the time to back down. It is not the time to become complacent. It's not time to rest on even prayers of previous seasons.
The Lord says, I have heard every prayer that's been prayed from the sanctuary and from the altar of this place. And the Lord says, I will begin to answer swiftly and quickly. The Lord says, 2015 will begin a year and a season of answered prayer. But the Lord says, I'm going to teach you even how to pray correctly. I'm going to teach you to see from my perspective. I'm going to teach you to not to pray the problem, but to pray the solution. The Lord says, this is a season where the word of the Lord will run swiftly. And I will fulfill my good pleasure for the people of God in this place. The Lord says, this land that you're on is set apart land. It is set apart from the foundation of the earth. The angels of God have been on guard on this land to open up a well of the river and the glory of God and to unlock heavenly things for the people in this region. For there has been a, a false understanding of who I am in this region. Religion and philosophies of man and the will of man have even stopped the purposes of the Lord. The Lord said, ask even for the blacks and the Spanish to come. Ask for them to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west, for they are part of your harvest and they are part of your inheritance. And I desire Restoration Christian Fellowship to be one who breaks down racial barriers, one who breaks every misconception that there is a white church, black church, Hispanic church, Korean church. The Lord says, I even, want, I even, I even see right now even a Spanish worship service. So the Lord says, know that you're on my heart. Know that you're in proper position, but in the coming months and seasons, I want to position you greater. And I want to stretch, you know, the picture that I see, I want to stretch you, says the Lord, like Gumby in every way. I want to stretch your faith for what you thought was absolutely out of reach. It's possible as you trust me and as you hear my voice. The Lord says, do not define what I can do by what I have done in the past, even here. For in the past, you've seen my goodness, but I want to bring you in to a glorious future of purpose, power, and presence that you have not known. Indeed, I desire to do above and beyond what you could ask or Above and beyond what you could ask or think. So, Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for what you desire to do. Thank you that your angels are here and they're on assignment. Thank you they come as ministering spirits to help the preaching of your word. Now let the spirit of wisdom and revelation rest upon this word. Thank you for hungry people who've come out on a Saturday night. And Lord, thank you that they're training for the purposes of God. There's an equipping here. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to articulate what you want to say. Give people an ear to hear and an eye to see. God, let there be a return. 30, 60, 100 fold return. Lord, thank you because there's activation and impartation of the purposes of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I felt uh, just uh, talking to the Lord today, I felt to talk about uh, the subject of faith tonight. And uh, obviously you can't touch the subject of faith in one sitting and one setting, but I'll try and get through to what I feel like God was uh, breathing on. The first principle that I believe is really important when we talk about the subject of faith is that every person ever existed. Humanity was made to live governed by the gift of faith. Humanity was woven together by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and made in the image of God. I love that because the image is the likeness and resemblance of God. It's the pattern after God. I like what one of my friends says. Uh, uh, she said, humanity was given a portion of the personality of God. We're three-part beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They work in unison with each other. We're meant to work in unison with God. Amen. It was the breath of God that made humanity a living soul. It's, it's only God that can create dirt and then come and go. And it's like this picture. The picture in the Hebrew is, is this master 
uh, this master potter creating his clay of what he intends. And he goes, that's what gives us a soul. It's the breath of God. And so everyone in here is simply beautiful dirt. And you're actually an earthly being because you're made of the dirt. That's why we'll go back to dirt. But you're also a heavenly being because the breath of God created you. I love the pattern in Scripture because in, the, in Genesis, God breathes and breathes into humanity and makes him a living soul. In Jesus, he is a resurrected Jesus. He stands as our elder brother, understanding and the ability to identify with everything we've gone through except that he didn't sin. I like Jesus. Jesus is the most fascinating, beautiful person I have ever met. He's kind. He's loving. He's my friend. But the one who was there at creation, who spoke the universe into existence, humbled himself, fully God, fully man, but puts himself within the limits of humanity. That, my friends, is humility. And then, I mean, I can't imagine Jesus when he was in the synagogue. You know, they're teaching and they're pontificating and they're probably saying a bunch of stuff that he never intended and he wrote the book and he's still listening. I want to see the lost years of Jesus. What was Jesus like? Do you know, Jesus was a marketplace minister. Jesus was, did not have that disease that a lot of people have in America. I'm in ministry, so I'm not doing anything. <laughs> the perfect child Je uh, Jesus eat your spinach okay Jesus it's time to go to bed okay like how did they potty train Jesus <laughs> did he have issues or did he just get it I don't know it's like he was fully God or <laughs> was it a sin when he you know obviously it wasn't a sin if he messed up you know like these are all questions I ask myself. <laughs> Humanity was wired for dependence upon Him as a source of all things, both in heaven and on earth. While we were made uniquely as individuals, humanity has a common bond for us to receive from God and, ex and experience that which He intended for us as we put our trust in Him. So humanity was made to, be, to live governed by the gift of faith. Number two, God has given humanity the gift of faith. Now here is really, really a fascinating kingdom principle to me. And that is this. That God makes you wired. The way you were built, the way you were created. The, the only, the best adjective so far I've come up with is this. Your operating system was meant to commune with God. Your, your eyes, your ears, your, your hands, your feet were all meant as avenues by which God can touch, you can experience His supernatural power, and you could fellowship with Him. It's exciting. And so He makes you with this need to need fellowship with Him. That's why a lifestyle of encounter is so important. Because your life will never be as God intended it to be if you're not having a lifestyle of consistent encounter with Him. You'll miss a step along the way. Your operating system will be in 1972 when God has you in 2015. There's a lot of upgrades many people in the body of Christ have missed. And the fascinating thing to me is they like sitting in coach class when God is putting them in business class. That's really fascinating to me. I've never gone, no, I'm good. I'll just, I'll, I'll sit in cattle class. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I'm a little man. I need, anyway, different subject. But he makes you in deep need of him. And then he goes, I need you, for you to operate correctly, you need to come into Christ and you need to fellowship with me. But he can't make us fellowship with him. So he says things like through James. He'll go, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. So I love this. So, so you're going, okay, God, I, I, I 
want to know you. I want to fellowship with you. This is hard. I've never done this before. Remember the first day I sat after this life-changing surrender to God. I'm going, I'm going to know you. And I sat there for two minutes. I go, this is horrible. How does anyone do this? You know, I read, I read these stories of like people like, and God just came in. No, he since then has, but it wasn't like that. It was like your words were going to the ceiling. Me, not you. I know none of you. Are, I know everything's awesome every time you get together with God and you just feel like you're fruitful all the time. And anyway. So then you go, oh, this is, this is, okay, I'm going to come close. And then you come close and he goes, wow, I'm going to reward you for what I gave you the power to do. But I cannot do for you what I've asked you to do. It's fascinating that God actually rewards humanity for what he gave him the power to do, but we still, we, we, he still cannot make us do what he's asked us to do. It's a fascinating exchange. Being made in the image of God, he gives us the power of choice, and he also gives us the measure of faith as a gift to us. Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10, if you want to follow along. For by grace you have been saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which we prepared beforehand that we should walk in. I asked the Lord one time, because here's a principle that you need to remember and keep in front of you as we discuss this concept of faith here. Every person in this room, before you were born, I've been fascinated with this concept of how the greatest discipler in your life is supposed to be the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He brings you into this glorious kingdom. It's a kingdom without limits. It's a kingdom that has no end. And he gives you, I love part of being part of the kingdom of God because he gives you everything up front. It's not like he goes, if you're good enough, I'll give you some of it. You get all the resources of the kingdom are available to you the day you become born again. And his desire is, he said, he planned you before the foundation of the earth to, to, to do good works. He declares the end from the beginning. So he has already gone into the future, and he already sees what he's intended you to be, intended you to do, and he has created a lifestyle to teach you how to walk with him so that everything could be possible with you. He declares the end from the beginning, and he goes before you. And his desire is this, to teach you how to do life with him in every single area of life. A lot of people don't realize that the Holy Spirit actually wants to do life with them, not religion. Why is that important though? He said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every person in this room, you are being discipled a certain way. You have been taught by your environment, by your upbringing, by your schooling. You've been taught to think about money. You've been taught to think about your family. You've been taught to think about your career, objects, the things you own. You think about it a certain way. There is no demilitarized zone in how you think about certain things. The question now in the kingdom of God is, are you thinking about these things according to God's perspective? Big question. Because what you believe about God, about a particular area, will often manifest what you believe in that particular area, even if it's untruth. Perception is a really powerful thing. What do I mean by perception? A lot of people have a perception about certain things. They have a perception about a biblical idea. And their perception defines their mindset about that. Now the question is, is their perception in line with truth? I'll take this. I I don't know anything about marriage. I don't. Never done it. Let's just talk to leaders. Two leaders have a conflict. And I know you think that never happens. So you sit down with leader A. Leader A tells you about this conflict. And you're listening to him. And you go, man... That is a very interesting story he tells. He's really, that doesn't sound too good about leader B. And it's the same situation. 
And so he said, thank you very much. You bring in leader B. And he starts talking about the situation. And he starts talking about it completely different. And when you listen to both of them talk, not Leader A and Leader B is not knowingly lying, but their perception of the situation has been framed by how they view it. The question is, is your perception in line with the truth of the Spirit of God and the Word of God? So that's why when you stand up and say that God is a capitalist, you get some looks from certain people because they've been discipled a certain way. They've been taught... Anyway... I'll just leave it there. (laughs) Faith is a necessary gift that must be appropriated to humanity to not only enter into the new life that God intends for us, but also to receive the benefits and the experiences of the kingdom. Faith in God is this, to live with the absolute conviction that what God has declared about himself to be true. Faith is a positioning of our hearts in which we have absolute conviction and assurance that what, that which we believe is true and it is not defined by our circumstances. Here ha- here's how uh, the, I call it maybe a little bit of the anatomy, the anatomy of faith. God has what I label, uh, God has given to every humanity, every person ever born, what, what we can describe as saving faith. Saving faith is the gift given to all of humanity to receive the gift of salvation given to them on the cross through the sacrifice of Jesus. God gives each person a measure of faith because faith is the only thing that will unlock the the door into the new life and into the kingdom of God. Faith is the only thing that pleases God. It's possible to have an experience with God and an encounter with God, yet not have appropriated faith in Him to enter the, into the kingdom of God or extract the experience that you've, you, you have had. How is that possible? I, don't, I, I know it's very interesting. Matthew 7. Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in Your name, cast out demons in Your name? What's fascinating there is that He didn't go, you had false, pro- false prophecies, Pastor Rick. Your miracles were wrong. He didn't say that. What he challenged was the foundation by which they did that. Here's another really interesting thought. They thought they were in line with him, and God goes, I never knew you. They were deceived, thinking they had a relationship with God, because they based it on external things. The Apostle Paul, Saul at the time, had an encounter with God, but he needed to receive Jesus' message to appropriate the encounter in what God intended. There are many people, well, we'll look at it in a minute. For I say to you, to the grace given to me, this is Romans 12, verse 3, to everyone who is among you, to not think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, here it is, as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Excuse me. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he, he who comes to God must believe. What must they believe? They must believe what he says about himself. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. When we became born again, whether we heard a message, had a dream, I'm fascinated with the way some people get born again. I've had some people that I know that nobody witnessed to them in a sense. They just had, they literally, Jesus came to them in a dream and said, I am the Messiah that you've been asking about. I'm telling you, God will respond to a sincere heart. Because his desire is for all people to come into relationship with him. But when we came into the kingdom of God, something bore witness in, in our hearts of what we heard or we experienced. It was the measure of faith. Remember, God actually gives you the gift so you can enter into the kingdom and then he rewards you for the gift that he gave you. Fascinating. I, li- I mean, how many have been to school here? When I went to, I, I went to, I don't know, I've been to way too much school. 
No, I don't, I, I don't say that. I've been seven years of school or something, three different degrees, I don't know. So my desire, I got a little more mature as I went on, but my desire was not to learn as much as I could from the course. It was to figure out where the test was coming from. And I did my very best to know what was going to... I was prepared for those tests. I was prepared to write those papers. I actually preferred writing papers. And some of you go, I know, you talk a lot. (laughs) But wouldn't it be great to have the answers to all the tests? God actually gives you the answer before the test even begins. And go, "Here's here's the answer. Here's the answer for all of life. Pretty good deal. It was a measure of faith that, that was given to humanity that made them res- be able to respond to the gospel message by whatever that came. While we recognize it was not certainly on our merit, it was our choice to surrender to what we had heard. When we choose... Now, listen to this. When we choose to place our trust in God, it did not mean we understand the process by how God could give us a new life or wash away our sins, but it was simple trust in Him. Why is that important? Because here it is. Whether you know it or not, if you're in right relationship with God, when you surrendered your life to God, this is what you came to believe. You believe that there was a God who spoke the universe into existence. You believe that He... He picked a man, Abram, called Abraham. Well, he put man in a garden, perfectly perfect. I want to see that Netflix. What did the world look like when it was perfect? What did that garden look like? What did Adam look like? Because, you know, that, that's sometimes been the question. How old was he when he came into the earth? Yeah, He was an adult. He didn't come out, baby Adam. <laughs> Adam and Eve, he, Adam and Eve choose to believe the lie of the devil, so destruction enters the world, but God wasn't freaked out. He goes, well, I'll find Abraham, I'll create a nation, I'll make a nation out of Abraham. He creates Israel, this nation of chosen people, to show forth his glory in the earth. They don't fully uh, uh, fulfill everything he desired of them, but God would not be without. So the first time, in the Old Testament, he would come to places, he would come to upon people, he would come to strategic geographical areas. But in the New Testament, 400 years of silence in the New Testament, here comes Jesus, and the Word became flesh. And for the first time in human history, the glory of God actually dwelled in a human vessel. He was born of a virgin. She was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He walked the earth. Three years, he, he begins his public ministry after being a carpenter. He picks these guys from lower Alabama who all needed deliverance. <laughs> Peter, Peter had some cussing issues, I'm convinced. <laughs> He picks these men. He does. He teaches like no one else had heard. Can you imagine listening to Jesus teach? The power and the authority and the love that rested upon what he was saying. John says, if you could, you only have a tiny little, like, little piece of sand of what he did when he walked the earth in the Bible. He said, the books of the world could not contain what Jesus did. I'm convinced that Jesus had services like Benny Hinn. I'm convinced there were miracles. Touch, touch, touch. (laughs) And I'm convinced Peter tried it out too, you know. I'm convinced. It's just my own conjecture. But then he died. He died. He didn't just fake die. He didn't Hollywood die. He died on a cross. Took the sin of all humanity. Rose again on the third day. And historically people saw him. And through that death, he ascended into, well, he said, all authority has been given unto me. Now go and make disciples of all nations. And through that death, he unlocked a door for all of humanity to come, not just to the perfect place that Adam was, but to come into fellowship with God. 
When you got born again, you may not have understood all of that. But you believed it anyway. What did you do? You stepped into it by faith. the origins of our faith. You see, we must not just introduce people to a prayer. We must introduce them to a person who is a way of life. I'm thankful. I really am. I'm thankful for anything that God uses to bring people into the kingdom of God. But I don't understand this thing. Jesus cast out demons, and now leaders want to make their churches comfortable to demons. We want people to be comfortable. We want them to feel nice. I want them to be feel welcome, but I want all their demons to leave. I want all their demons to leave right in front of all the big givers in the church who don't like it. <laughs> Faith in the kingdom unlocks the possibilities of what we're believing. See, that's really important because we trust not because we understood that story, but when we trusted, we knew that we'd been set free from sin and darkness. Amen. Faith became a, the door to understanding. That's a key in the kingdom because many people in life, they want to see it and then they want to see it to believe it. In the kingdom, you trust and then receive it. Here's what he said. Here's the writer of Hebrews. He articulates this principle. In the, let me say this. In the kingdom of God, our faith is what causes us to understand. Understanding in the kingdom is an experience. This is opposed to how we are taught in the world system. That when we see it, we'll believe it. Here it is. Hebrews 11.3. By faith, how do we understand it? By faith, we understand. By faith, we understand. We don't understand and have faith. That's part of the big problem. That the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which are visible. Paul would later pick up on this language. He said, we don't look at what we can nearly see we don't look at what we can see in front of us, but we trust in the things that are unseen. For the things that we see are subject to change. That's a really good experience. Good, really good word right there. I say that over my life every day. Everything that doesn't line up with my destiny is subject to change. Every promise over my life is yes and amen. Things are subject to change. This that doesn't appear right, it's subject to change. It might not change today, but it could change today. And it's changing in a moment of time because I put... My trust in God. Amen. The origins of our faith define how we're supposed to relate to God. We did not become a new creature outside of the gift of faith or the measure of faith. It is a gift of faith that God has given us. It is our entrance into the kingdom th that defines how we're supposed to relate, God, relate to God in the kingdom of God. Faith was intended as a gift that defined how we are to relate to God as a lifestyle. You know, it's really fascinating. Years ago, I remember somebody saying to me, you know, I really admire you. I said, really? Because I'm so tall? Uh, I know, muscular, good looking, all those other things. I said, you, you live by faith. You know, you're trusting God to meet your needs. And I go, yeah, what are you living by? See, they identified, their words identified how they thought. My Bible said, the just shall live by faith. Well, I could never do that. I'll let God do it. Is your faith, is your trust more in your employer than in God? Is your trust more in what you have in your savings account than in God? Is your trust more in this or that because you know it will work for you? At the center of a life of living by faith is living with the conviction that God is our source 
of all things. God is our source of all things. That's why he's never broke. He never, I love the thing about God that he loves doing life with us. So, and he's never, he's never like thrown back by anything that you didn't plan. He's not like, oh man, what are you going to do, man? Your tire fell down. You don't have money for tires. He's not going, man, I wonder what they're going to do. Good luck with that. He goes, oh man, your power bill's double than what you were expecting this month. What are you going to do about that one? It's not like he's up there. He doesn't worry. He's never fearful. God intends our faith in him to function in every area of our life. God intends our faith in him to function in every area of our life. See, your, your destiny and your assignment is way beyond even your greatest prophetic word. It's way beyond what you could even dream what God intends for your life. But you'll have to access that gift of faith to enter into it. Faith is equated with righteousness and is what pleases God in the kingdom of God. I love when it says, and Abraham pleased God because he trusted. Faith anchors us in the superior world of the kingdom. Faith is birthed in the inward man. Faith is not of the soul of the mind. The, the, the renewed mind operating in faith has the ability to affect our mind, will, and emotions. It's possible to receive from God that which we have not believed Him for, but it's not the norm. Faith creates the environment by which we're able to receive from God. Faith is the gift that God gives us to overcome. 1 John 5 verse 4. This is God's prophecy for every person in this room. For whatever is born of God. How many are born of God? Keep your hands raised. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Not just overcomes a few things. Not just overcomes this. Not just overcomes that. But overcomes everything. And this is the victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. It's our faith. It's our belief in God. It's our, it's our ability to go, wow, this is not lining up with the word of God. This is not lining up with the promises of God. But I choose to believe you. I, pu- I choose to put my trust in you. I'm not defined by this mountain, but I'm going to begin to speak to this mountain according to the will and the word of God. I'm thankful that God did not lead us as orphans in this world. I'm thankful that when you wake up any, every morning, we have the ability to trust Him and to see Him and to see His goodness break through on our behalf. Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Millions have believed God for saving faith, but have been robbed of living a life of faith because of ignorance, unbelief, fear, or religious structure that does not develop people in their identity. I said this that last night. What you believe about God and how God relates to you is critical to walking in a lifestyle of faith. You must believe as a settled issue that you have constant favor with God. You must believe that favor is a lifestyle, not a momentary visitation or a parking spot. I don't don't mind recognizing the favor of God in everything that I do, but... I, I, it, you know, it's just so much more than these little things. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen the favor of God on my life. Over and over. I, you, and you usually know it's like when someone goes, I don't know why I'm doing this for you. I do. 
I was flying home last fall. The Lord, I, I, I always usually try to take the first flight home because it's there and I want to go home. <laughs> and I'm done with my assignment wherever I'm at. But the Lord had asked me to do something that day. So I said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And there was a, a later flight, and I really didn't want to get on that one, but there was one like 30 minutes from when I pulled up to the gate or, or the, the counter, and I said, I'd like to get on the 2.30 flight if you have room on it. She goes, that's not possible. I said, you need to check. I have the favor of God upon my life. <laughs> and she said, this has never happened. You can get both of your luggage on, and you can get on this plane. It leaves in 15 minutes. I walked through the gate, and it was loading, and I got on the plane, and I went home early. Favor of God. I was flying to the, the Philippines last year. There was a very large gentleman. Lord help him. His name was Harry. And I knew I had to talk to Harry. So he sits down. I'm sitting on the plane. I'm sitting there in economy comfort, which is a little better than cattle class. <laughs> and he looks over at me and goes, somebody real big is going to sit between us. And then suddenly, you know, when things come out of your mouth, you're hoping, you, you're hoping it was God. I go, Harry, I got the favor of God upon my life, and we're going all the way to Manila. We started in Detroit. We're going to Detroit, to Tokyo, Japan, 12 and a half hours. Lord, help me. <laughs> Land in Manila. You go another five hours to Manila. You get off the plane. You do a circle. He goes, we'll see. <laughs> so my new friend, Harry, that door closes. I said, I got one down, one to go, Harry. We land in, we land in Tokyo. We get off the plane. And I'm, I'm, I'm half out of it, but I'm going, Lord, show forth your goodness. That plane door shuts about an hour into the flight. I said, Harry, I told you it would happen. And he said, you're right. That God thing works. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the favor of God will change rules and regulations for you. The favor of God will give you access to places that you have no business being. The favor of God will open every door that you need for your God-given assignment and you'll never have to do it yourself. And always remember, your favor is not what you've done. It simply comes to you as a gift of being in Christ and He is always the source. And I encourage, every time I see the favor of God, I always go, that's the favor of God. Every time somebody invites me, I always sit there, it's email, whatever, phone call, I go, that's the favor of God. Only God can do what he's done for me. He'll use people to do it. But I never look as people as my source. You must believe that God does not deal with you according to your performance, but according to the blood of Jesus and your new nature. You must believe that God is actually drawn to you in your weakness. You must believe that God has actually forgiven you and doesn't just put up with you. You must believe that you're dearly loved by God. This is a critical foundation to our belief system that must be developed because what you have difficulty believing in will often be the measure in which you'll be able to receive. In the life of faith, we must develop the ability to not only give, but also to receive. God intends the measure of faith to grow in us. I'm glad you asked, how does faith grow? He gives us the measure of faith when we're born again, but he intends for that seed to grow and for all things to be possible. You know, it's fascinating. I'm learning this, that not only myself, but everybody in this room would probably say, God can do anything. Yeah, God can do anything. Praise God, brother. Believe that. It's on our sign. It's on our website. It's on our statement of faith. Most people have no trouble believing that God can do anything. The trouble is believing that God can do anything through them. Back to that identity thing. Huh? The life of faith cannot be divorced from anyone in this room. Just like somebody, you know, many years ago, and I'm sure they were well intentioned. Wow, you're believing God for this. Everything you do, you should be believing God for something. What are you believing God for? 
What are you believing God in your family? What are you believing God for in your finances? What do you believe? You know, I have a, you know, one of the reasons I love the, I love the concept of how God thinks about money. I love the concept that God delights everyone, wants to empower everyone to prosper is this, because my goal is eventually to give, uh, to, to make my highest expense giving. Because that's the nature of God. I got one amen, but it's true anyway. What's the first thing he does in that garden? He blesses them. He empowers them to prosper because he's got this giving nature. He's always giving, 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 giving to people who don't even deserve it. That's us in the kingdom. Romans 1, verse 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus viewed faith as having measurable and having degrees. And when he heard these things, he marveled at him and turned... Well, we'll read that story immediately. Matthew 14, verse 31. Immediately he stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, this is, this is Peter falling in the water, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? See, God has a standard and he never lowers it according to our experience. It's fascinating. You ever think about that? Peter, the only person in history that I know, walked on water because he had a word from God, but he's the one God, God, is that you? I want to come. I'm like that. That's you, Jesus. I'm going. But the response of Jesus is amazing. I encourage you to read the response of Jesus to people, especially his interaction with his disciples. Because he's never cruel. He's never... I'm convinced that if Jesus was an American pastor, some people would try and vote him out. You believe that? Peter walked on water. Ain't nobody ever done that. And Jesus was mean to him. He said to him, Oh, ye a little faith. Why did you doubt? He didn't go... Peter, you're doing really good. I'm going to have Matthew remember that one. They'll remember you forever. No, he always used it as a teaching point to bring them up to his level of experience. He comes down off a mountain. Two dead guys show up. The Bible is really fascinating. Really fast. There is a great cloud of witnesses. They really are. There's probably people watching in heaven tonight. I wonder if Brother Hagen's listening to this tonight going, man, that's not bad. <laughs> he comes off a mountain and, they, and, and the, the young boy has been foaming at his mouth. The dad brings it to him. I want to suggest to you that I've never gone to a service and brought any of my sick friends to go, hey, let's go to that church. They don't believe in miracles. The reason I'm saying that is they brought him to his disciple because it, they, the man must have known that they had some sort of history in doing miracles. So he says to him, he didn't go, guys, you're doing really good. 80%, nobody's ever done that one. Let me take this one. I'll take it because I'm the son of God. He goes, oh, faithless generation, how long will I be with you? Because God's greatest desire through Jesus was not simply to express what Jesus could do, but to express what humanity could do in right relationship with him. And here's the thing. I've noticed he's always marching forward. He, he's never, I, I, you know, he ne- it's like he, you think you're doing good in a particular area until he starts speaking to you about it. You're like, oh, I can, oh, wow, I did pretty good there. And he goes, I, I, I'm going to stretch you again. Remember one time the Lord said, I, a few weeks, a few months ago, I think I was going, whoo, I thought I was going to do it. He goes, you don't have to do it, but you'll never, you, you won't grow in that area. See, you can live out of a principle and have certain results. And it doesn't mean you're not going to heaven, but you're not maximizing a particular area that God wants to continually stretch you in.
Matthew 8. And when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the word. So the word of God is a critical aspect, we know, of growing in the lifestyle of faith. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he comes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Then Jesus heard it, and he marveled. Stop right there. My goal is to make Jesus marvel at my belief of everything he says. Can you imagine? This Gentile made Jesus marvel at his faith. Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith. See, Jesus actually spoke of degrees of faith in Scripture. He goes, nah, you got small faith. You think you got big faith, but you got small faith. Oh, this is great faith. Not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness and they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way as you have believed, as you have believed about me and as you believed about your situation. As you've believed about me and about your situation. You gotta ask yourself of every challenge that you're facing, what is it about the nature of God that cannot touch that area? Like, well, I need healing. You pay for that one on the cross. I've been struggling financially. Well, he's not broken. He's got a system of finances. I need, a, I, need a, I, need a, I need a promotion on my job. Well, he's got that one covered through the favor of God. What is it about God that he's too small to handle in your life? So then faith comes by hearing. And I love what the, the Apostle Paul says because he says hearing twice and hearing by the word of God. There's something, and Jesus would say this when he was teaching, he who has ears, let him hear. Because it was, there's something about the ear that he uses that we hear the words of faith. We hear through rhema, through the written word. There's something about those words that are supposed to cause the life of faith to come inside of us where we believe and we trust and we receive in that moment even though our circumstance hasn't changed. He who has ears, let him hear. This is what I've come to discover. When you hear something, the word of God, what uh, Hebrews 4 verse 12, let's look at that for a minute. This is fun tonight. Are you having fun? Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. What is that two-edged sword? I don't know much about swords, so I began to understand about swords. Piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and what's fascinating there, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So here's what, what part of the process is. When we hear something, the word of God comes like a sword, and I found it's two-edged. It will locate how you're thinking and where God wants to take you in your current process. It could be through the reading of Scripture. I love Scripture. I I love Scripture. Like if you're bored reading Scripture, you're reading the American Bible. Mm -hmm. What a book. And I love the thing about God. He doesn't like sugarcoat anything. He tells you the whole story. He's definitely not like CNN. Definitely not like MSNBC. He locates where you're at and how he'd like, to th- uh, like for you to think. See, and every time he speaks, he's trying to give us an upgrade not only in our righteousness and our identity, but a shift in thinking. And often that has to do with the ability to receive what we're thinking about in that particular area. 
I remember many years ago, I was driving through the back roads of South Carolina, and I heard the Lord say to me, He said, why is it, you know, I, I, you know, I was, good prayer. Lord, speak for your servant ears. Pray like Samuel. And he will tell you, oh, Lord Jesus, walking with the Holy Spirit is the most wonderful thing. He says the most outlandish things to me. He's very enjoyable. He really is. Taste and see. He goes, why is it you don't believe half of what I tell you? And he said, I need you to start believing the things I'm telling you because I'd like to do certain things in my life. What was he doing? He was locating my current thought process to where he would like me to think. And in that shift, because every time he speaks, it's an invitation to intimacy, but it's also an invitation to shift my identity before him. Locates where you're at and where he'd like to take you. And also needs an identity shift. And here's what I've come to know. I cannot just hear it once, but I've learned I have to hear it over and over and over and over again. Because often what you hear will war against how you've been discipled in this world system. You, it's so fascinating. Even the great heroes of faith, they... They, God, I was reading about Moses this morning. And he, he goes, this is who you are. And he goes, who am I? And he could, it was always this struggle to identify with God, who God had called them to be and who they were supposed to be in their identity. Fascinating stuff. So there, there's that famous line in scripture. I find Saul to be one of the most fascinating people in scripture. Samuel gives him this amazing prophetic word and he goes, who are you talking about? What was it? Everything in Saul's identity that was negative, that was contrary to what God intended him to be, came to the surface and challenged the word that the prophet gave him. I've been there. Remember years ago, seven years ago, this dear man just, just passed away. One of the great, one of the trusted prophets in my life. He's giving me this word and he's an unusual man. He blows his trumpet over me. I'm on the floor. It's a, it's a good Pentecostal meeting. You know, it's good. <laughs> God showed up. And I hear him giving this prophetic word. And I said, whoever is getting that word is getting one of the most amazing words I ever heard. And then I realized he was prophesying over me. That word was challenging everything contrary to what God had called me to be in that moment. So what have I learned to do? I've learned to hear those words over and over and over and over and over again. And what will come to the surface is every con every contrary thing, every negative thing, everything opposed to the knowledge of God. And I choose every day, I go, well, I don't even feel that. I don't feel it. doesn't feel like me. I'm not like that. But I begin to define my internal reality by who God says I am. Simply hearing a word doesn't change anything. That's simply the revelation. Faith must wrap itself around that revelation and you must upgrade your identity from that place of revelation. You know, you hear a word. You're a warrior. God has made you a warrior. But you know you're a wimp. <laughs> you know you fall apart at every challenge. <laughs> It's, a, it's an invitation to upgrade your identity. Amen. I remember right, right at the beginning, right, right at the end of the year, I was in California and the Lord had spoke something to me. And I, I was like, really? I go, that's just so, like, that's impossible. Not possible. And finally, I was running one day. I was thinking about what God had told me. I think it was the last day of the year. I said, you know what, God? You said it, and it's possible. And I choose to believe, and I will never question it from this moment forward. So the word of God helps us to grow. Revelation creates the playing field for our faith. God marries his word to us as a function of our relationship with him. Not only hearing revelation, but also receiving revelation is critical in growing our faith. Revelation is critical because without it, we perish. That's why the apostle Paul prayed, I pray that the spirit 
of wisdom and revelation would come to you in the knowledge of God. So the word of God, grow, the, the, our faith grows. One of the tools that God gives is the word of God. Secondly is a life of risk. Faith believes as facts before there is evidence. God will often demand action before there is faith. I used last night, I won't go into it tonight, tithing as our example. Jesus described the greatest of faith as one who believed without ever having evidence. Jesus said to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed, that means empowered to prosper. Those who have not seen, yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Third thing is our testimonies. Our testimonies, the things that we've seen from God are supposed to be things that we use as tools to help overcome the obstacle that we've seen. Often like to use everything that God does in front of us is supposed to shift our consciousness. Jesus never did a miracle simply for the purpose of a miracle, but to upgrade their identity and who he was. What, 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 uh, There's, do you remember Matt, Mark, the sixth chapter? Do you remember when Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fishes? Remember that? He takes, what do you got? What was he asking? He was asking for a seed. What do you have that's in your hand? What was he trying to, he, again, he's trying to upgrade their identity. Orphans always think they don't have. Sons of God always know that there's more than enough. What did the... It's fascinating. It wasn't a TBN evangelist who asked the woman who's about to die and is bankrupt for a seed. The prophet said to her, what do you have? Well, we got some... Well, all we got is oil. First she says, we don't have anything. Then she goes, we got oil. What was he asking for? He was trying to take... what He's always trying to show you that you are never without a deficit. Even you might need his supernatural intervention. He's trying to make you a participator in the miracle. He's trying to show you, it's you and me, it's my divine partnership with you that causes the impossible to happen. And the great thing about this, it's okay if you're like Peter and took a few steps and sunk. I'd rather you take a few steps and sink than never take any steps at all. But everything he does is from an eternal consciousness. Every time, let's say you saw a healing. Let's say you saw a miracle. Let's say you saw it. It's supposed to, the next time you see, let's say you saw a back healed. You saw it right in front of you. The next time you see somebody with a back uh, that's out of order, you, you call upon that testimony. You go, he did it back then. And we proclaim this testimony. And we say he'll do it again. So when he taught the, here, here's how he taught the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and your strength. And what does he do? He tells them how you do it. Verse 6, Jesus quotes this when they ask him the greatest commandment. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. What were they supposed to talk about? They were supposed to talk about what God did. Why? Because it's supposed to change the way you think. How many have ever seen God come through for you financially when you were in a hole? How many after that had another financial problem? How many forgot that testimony that God did? <laughs> See, I've learned Every time I see the hand of God, I go, I must remember this moment forever. It wasn't just a miracle. It wasn't just a healing. It wasn't just financial provision. It is the voice of God speaking through supernatural activity that every time I have that same mountain, I think about what he did and I celebrate it and I declare it, it will be part of my future. That's why it says this. Psalm, I encourage you to, it's a, David talks extensively in, in Psalm 119 about the testimonies of the Lord. 
He says, your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. The more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. So your testimonies help build your faith. I do that. I've learned to do that over the last number of years. The Lord taught me that. That's why often, when I and I in my home office, I have a, a calendar. I have a, a documentation of things that God done as in previous years. So I have my prophetic words because they tell me where God wants to take me. I have His promises over a particular area, and I go. This is what you did in 2014. This is what you did in this situation. This is the promise we have. And we begin to declare and we begin to confess that promise. It's another way your faith grows. Confession. Faith grows through our confession. Confession is a manifestation of trust and thankfulness for that which we believe and often have not seen. Thankfulness is the currency of the language of faith. Even today, I was sitting in my hotel room. I'd been believing God for something in a particular area. And I just began to say, thank you, God, because I've received that already. Thank you, because I don't know how it's coming, but you're going to get it to me because you promised it to me. It's on its way. Here it is. And so I choose to thank you. Why am I choosing to thank you? Because I'm basing it upon the nature of God. One of my favorite verses in Scripture. My covenant will I keep, nor shall I alter the thing that comes out of my lips. See, I love this because at creation... God's desire was expressed in his words and every word he spoke happened. He wants you to believe everything you speak will happen. Make it your goal for your words to be like God's words. We really, honestly, we need to take a careful inventory in our lives. I've really have made a conscious decision over the last year to do that, even in the small things. Sometimes if I, if I don't think I can remember something, I said, I'm going to try my best to do that, but I'm not going to promise you because I want my word to be like God's word. Some of you need to change your voicemails. I'll call you back. As soon as I get a chance, you don't ever call anyone. You don't even call your mama back. <laughs> There's pastors that don't call people back. And I'm coming to minister in the church. (laughs) I always wondered. You know, sometimes people are praying for certain things and God's trying to open a door for them, but since they don't ever respond, I got... We have a policy. We respond to every phone call in our ministry. He's the most crazy person ever. We tell him, God bless you. You're crazy. And we love you. I'll be there in 20 minutes. You're an hour away. You're late for everything. See, sometimes we've come to believe, especially in this American culture, we, it, it's just, we're just so used to people never following up on what they say. And we've come to believe in a lot of ways that that's how God treats us. He believes everything He's told you. He wants you to believe it too. You know, sometimes, yes, there's moments where you must stand in faith. There's moments where you must encourage yourself. But one thing I've noticed by walking with God, sometimes the, the greatest confession is this. God, I don't know, I don't understand this. I don't know what's happening. I know the promise you've given me, but I will trust you. I will 
I trust you. This is not my situation to handle. That's another, you don't have to live with stress. You don't have to live with fear. You don't have to live with worry. See, a lot of people have lived with that so long, it's part of their identity. They think something's wrong if they're not worried about something. What's wrong with me? I'm not stressing out. Faith must be appropriated. As we journey into a life of growing in faith, we must recognize that the Holy Spirit will often expose areas of, of, of an unbelief that hinder our fruitfulness. Faith must be appropriated. Faith is the substance of the things we hope for. Faith is the substance of the things we hope for. Faith, that word substance, is the assurance that what we're hoping for will come to pass. Faith unlocks the doors to impossibility. Do you know, we know that faith is not from here. You can't make yourself believe certain things. It comes from here. Faith is of the heart. Often, our intellect will try and define our faith. God is not opposed to the intellect. Please think. Run into two, way too many people who didn't think before they got married. I love him. He doesn't have a job. He lives with his mom in his basement. But I love him. Please think. Please think. Because the rest of us and your children, anyway, different story. Please think. But you cannot allow your intellect, and this is a really big deal, because I believe, especially in the Western church, there's been this unhealthy, and I believe in, you know, I, I believe in the intellect. I'm not destroying the intellect. There's a place for intellect. We have exalted the intellect above revelation knowledge. And we've called it walking in wisdom. And it cuts people off, not only from the blessing of God, from a life of faith and a life of doing the impossible. Mark 6, fascinating scripture. Jesus is in his hometown preaching. And it says, you can read it. I, I, I've gone a while tonight. But that's okay. I think you're hungry. He's speaking. I, I, I want to see. I'm, honestly, I really, I, I'm not joking. I want to see a video clip of Jesus preaching one day. What was that like? The words of life that would probably come out of him. You think some preachers are good preachers. Like, he probably, like, to me, Jesus makes one statement in Scripture and I'm still meditating on it. You know, sometimes people want to know from prophetically, what's the newest thing got God's on? I'm still trying to figure out what he did 2,000 years ago. I'm still trying to apply that in my life. But he's speaking and it says, their hearts came alive. They go, this is the Son of God. But their intellect shut down the revelation knowledge they were receiving. They, they, began, to, they began to look at him by what they knew. Well, that Joseph boy, ain't it? That carpentry, a lot of money. It was real nice though. And his mom a little bit of a kook pregnant by the Holy Spirit think about it they didn't believe Jesus you think they believed Mary when she showed up pregnant in the synagogue most of them probably thought she should have been stoned and it says and Jesus could do no mighty miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people the Spanish translation of the Bible which is closer, obviously, to the Romance language, says this, and Jesus wanted to do miracles, but he couldn't. How is it possible that the Son of God, who maybe wanted to heal marriages, wanted to heal bodies, wanted to set people free, couldn't do things because of the way they looked at him? They allowed their intellect to shut off their revelation that they were receiving.
Faith unlocks the doors to impossibility. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Mark 11, 20, verse 20 through 24. The verse Kenneth Hagin wrote. Mm. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots, and Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you have cursed has withered away. It's impossible to speak to something, and what you speak comes to pass. And he's taking this impossible thing and going to his disciples. Guys, I want to show you that when you speak to things, you actually have the power to define what they'll do. You actually have the power through what comes out of your mouth that in any situation, what you declare can begin to shift your situation. So Jesus answered him, Have faith in God, for surely I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says. Believe those things he says will be done, and he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Some translations say, the Jewish New Testament says, have the kind of trust that comes from God. Have God's faith. Take hold of God's faithfulness. Here's some final thoughts on faith. Hope you got something out of this tonight. Faith is implicit trust in God. Faith is the only currency that pleases God. Faith believes and receives before it sees. Faith is persistent. Faith must be developed. Faith is a conviction of understanding. God will allow a challenge to locate your faith. Faith is what draws the things we hope for towards us. Remember uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe, maybe two years now, the Lord said to me, when we're dominated with the vision that the Father has given us, we live from access of what causes that word to take place. When we're meditating, when we're confessing, when we're going, this is what God has said. The unseen world of God is moving our, on our behalf to cause those things that we're believing God for to take place. That is good news. Some of you may be believing God for certain things right now. And as you stand in that place of faith, you have no idea the angels of God that are being released on your behalf for the purposes of God. Faith is supposed to operate regardless of environment or situation. Faith is supposed to dominate our thought process. The gift of faith has been given to every believer to declare the supremacy of God in all things. At the root, faith says, you are the God who created the universe, you are the God who does all things, and you are the God that I choose to trust. When you're challenged in any area to believe God, the biggest question is, do you really trust God's hand to be able to intervene in that area? That's really the question. Do you trust God? And is God able to do it? And then secondly is, is he able to do it for you? Yes, he is. Because Paul Peter said, and I perceive this, that God is no respecter of persons. I perceive now, it's not just one or two, but I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Thank you, Lord. If you receive this word, I just want you to lift your hands to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. 
The eyes of the Lord are searching the earth for people strong in faith. Their strength comes not of their own will and volition, but their strength comes from Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And I believe the group of people in this room, God is calling you, he's calling me like Peter, to step out, walk on the water, to do what we never thought was possible, and to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. If you receive this word, I just want you to, I'm going to count to three, and I just want you to stand where you are. One, two, three, just stand. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask you to do something else. As you've received this word, just as a sign of faith, I'm just going to count to three and I'm going to invite you to move out of your seats and just take a step forward here and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And something's going to be unlocked in that prayer for all of us in this room. So as you receive this, we're saying we're going from faith to faith and glory to glory. And I want to prophesy for some of you some situations that you've been believing God for many years are about to change even this week. One, two, three. Just come forward here. Just come forward. Just come, just come closer so we have room for everyone. Thank you, Lord. 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 If you would just um, lift your hands to heaven. I want you to repeat this in this prayer. I've only done this a few other times but I really, really feel like this is important tonight. I want to lead you in a prayer but I pray even for myself. I want to renounce any areas of in our life where we have unbelief, where we've partnered with the enemy knowingly or unknowingly. And we actually make this purposeful intention to trust God in every area. Maybe we've done it before. I'm sure many of you have, but there's something about this prayer that unlocks. And even this week, the Lord will just show you some of you just areas where it's like we know that we haven't been trusting God. There's no shame, no blame, no guilt, no condemnation. It's just an opportunity to upgrade thinking like God thinks in that area. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Whoa. There's a strong presence here. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. We're just going to count to three and let's just take another step forward. One, two, three. Just take a step forward. Whoa. 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 Mm. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Manara Bakaya Rabashaya. Whoa. Even as we stand here, somebody's lower back, the Lord is healing somebody's lower back. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. I just see like tonight, it's like a a prison in your own mind that some of you were. You didn't even recognize the Lord is just breaking you out of. Thank you, Lord. 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 